This week, we're gonna be talking about cognitive dissonance. Now, cognitive dissonance isn't really a skill. It's actually more of a state of mind. And it's a state that results when your thoughts or your feelings are not in line with your actions or your behaviors. And what results is this sort of feeling of psychological discomfort. And it's something that we are naturally motivated to try to resolve in some way. So we can resolve it in one of two ways. We can either bring our thoughts and our feelings more in line with our actions or behaviors, or we can bring our behaviors more in line with our thoughts and feelings. And one of the things we've learned about cognitive dissonance is that one of those methods of resolving the dissonance is actually more natural or more successful than the other. And that's the method by which we change our behaviors in order to readjust or align our thoughts. For example, I often tell my patients, you know, you kind of have to walk the walk before you can talk the talk. So if you want to change your thoughts about food or your food beliefs or food judgments, or if you want to change the way you feel about your body, you first need to start acting in a way that is in line with somebody who has a positive body image, who doesn't have food judgments or food rules. And that's going to be the more successful way to bring about a change in your thoughts or beliefs. So today to talk about this, I have Maris here with me. Maris, and I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about how this whole concept of cognitive dissonance showed up in your eating disorder recovery. Yeah, totally. So my family experienced a challenge that I think many families experience, which is this kind of pause moment of, shouldn't we wait until she has a better relationship with food to push the eating or to push challenge foods? And in reality, the eating disorder voice was so strong that I wasn't going to independently make that decision. And what would actually help me shift my relationship with food was eating those foods again and working through that discomfort. And I think many families get into that analysis paralysis phase of, well, shouldn't all these things be perfect and my mindset be perfect in order to make progress? And I think it, the opposite is true, right? I'm so glad you brought that up because I feel like that's a really common myth that I get a lot in working with patients and families, which is that like, well, like all the stars need to align. Like my thoughts need to be in line, my thoughts need to be different, or my motivation needs to be perfectly there in order to make a change. And in reality, it actually, it doesn't work that way. The behavior change happens first, and then we start to notice a change in our thoughts and feelings. I wonder if there are other ways. Um, you know, one of the examples I'm thinking about is um, concerns about body image. I feel like that's another really common like thought feeling um, thing that parents really would like to see shift during treatment. I'm wondering if you can speak to that a bit. Absolutely. So there were many things that I avoided because of my challenges with body image, whether it was avoiding wearing certain clothing or going to certain social events. And it was a similar thing where I was like, well, shouldn't I wait until my relationship with my body is better to go participate in those things or do those things? And it actually took me doing those things before I felt ready, before I had a more neutral or positive relationship with my body to um, you know, break my thinking around it and, and reshape my thinking around it. 